The high elves can best be characterized as a bunch of scrawny nerds with a few absolute chads in their ranks. While their infamous legendary lords do much of the heavy lifting for them, their heroes can absolutely be game changing on the battlefield and on the campaign map. While the hero characters are relatively straightforward to use, I'm going to run through some of the optimal ways to utilize them that will work in any campaign on any difficulty and will take you from struggling to win on normal to absolutely dominating on legendary difficulty. I'll be walking through the heroes in order of the tier you unlock them, the best strategies to use them in campaign and on the battlefield, followed by the best traits you can have on each hero type by spending influence when hiring them. Welcome to Elven Plot Armor, my name is Ryder, and welcome to my guide on how to master all four High Elf heroes for maximum benefit in your campaigns. The information presented in this guide is based on my thousands of hours of gameplay in tandem with community feedback, as well as playtesting of alternate playstyles. Rather than being masters of assassination and sabotage, the High Elves focus more on bolstering the faction's diplomacy and local economy while assisting the army on the battlefield. High Elves should always be striving to get their new provinces up to tier 4 to boost their hero cap and increase their faction benefits. Starting at tier 2 with the first hero you can recruit is the Noble. If you don't have a Noble in the early turns, consider building an Elven Court even if you scrap it immediately just to recruit a Noble. They are the best early game scouts and can easily gain levels by stealing influence. But in your armies they are invaluable in the early game, bolstering replenishment and on the battlefield they prove a small sturdy line holder holding blobs of infantry in place for your archers to shred. In addition to this, Nobles also provide respectable lay damage, something that High Elves are usually quite terrible at. Whilst the High Elf Spear Infantry are among the best in the entire game at holding the line defensively, having a Noble on the front lines actually allows them to deal some damage back and answer enemy heroes. In the early game, the Noble is arguably best being on both the battlefield and the campaign map. To do this, simply scout ahead with your Noble, Check that there's no danger in front and then move your main army up in ambush stance then return the noble to your army to aid replenishment. When attacking a settlement with your army you can sack it on the first turn and then send your noble out on the same turn to gather influence providing the best of all worlds and two opportunities to level up your hero. When leveling up, prioritize the steel influence and specialists to lower the cost. As well as boosting replenishment, maxing melee defense and armor should be your top priority to help your noble act as line holder. At level 10, nobles can select a diplomatic buff. While the High Elf buff can be useful in the early game, the knowledge of men buff will last well into the late game and really stacks up to keep the Empire on side whilst boosting your port revenue. Now I know the Eagle Mount is tempting because it's fast and makes an ideal way of baiting out enemy artillery, you are losing one of the few decent melee offensive units the High Elves have to field. The Noble is invaluable on the front line and if you really want an Eagle, just simply hire an Eagle or better yet, get a Fire Mage onto a Dragon. But my point being, keeping your Noble on foot is the best use for him. In the later campaign, the Chariot Mount is the only other mount you should really consider but it does require a lot of micro but can honestly prove a very powerful check on troublesome late game artillery. Once you level up your Elven Court to tier 4, you can recruit another Noble to either act as a scout or simply repeat my previous process being able to double as a scout and a general. Nobles can be hired with a number of good traits, but the three I've selected are, start with Emollient, which provides plus one public order to all provinces, as well as an extra five in his current province. And if that alone wasn't enough for you, it increases income from entertainment buildings by a whopping 5%. The next powerhouse trait is Conscientious. This gives plus five relations with men and high elves, plus two rank to any nobles, but most importantly gives plus two to any lord you hire. Having multiple nobles with this trait will mean you can hire higher level heroes, meaning you can have a good leveled Archmage to quickly raise up a force to stop a borderline province being taken or to quell a revolt with relative ease. Last and certainly not least is one of my favorites, which is Frugal, which reduces the upkeep for the nobles army by 15%, and this is awesome, especially if you're playing with lords like Imric where money is an issue. Because the noble traits offered to you are randomly generated, you are unlikely to get the exact combination you want when you ask for it. So I've listed an honourable mention here, the trait honed which provides plus 5 melee attack and melee defence to all your infantry, which actually goes quite a far way in making your high elves suck a little bit less in melee. Next, 
The moment your capital province gets to Tier 3, your first stop should be a Mage Tower to gain access to the biggest damage dealer in the entire High Elf roster, the Fire Mage. I always recommend choosing Fire Mages because of their unique Dragon Mount and Fire Magic's general strength. On the campaign map, Mages can block enemy armies to reduce enemy movement, but correct use of Ambush Stance typically negates the need for this as your army won't be visible for enemies to run from. Plus, your Fire Mage brings infinitely more value on the battlefield than on the campaign map. However, it's worth noting the Steel Research ability can add up to faster technologies whilst getting your mage up to those higher levels quickly. When leveling your Fire Mage, focus on getting 3 points in your primary spell, here, Burning Head, and then 1 point in the passive. Keep working along this tree to unlock Arcane Conduits, with the one exception that at level 7, you put your mage on a horse. Mages have spare skill points for days, so you are not going to miss this point, but more importantly, she will be able to ride up, drop burning heads and decide a battle before your army even engages. More importantly, she is much easier to keep alive on a horse until you unlock immortality or get her onto her dragon mount at level 22. Once you have arcane conduit, keep on boosting your wins reserve and select other spells you might use before opting for cleanse corruption and scouting for magical weapons. Now to quickly address the other popular schools of magic starting with light, which has a few really really great spells, namely its signature net of Amentok, which is great to hold enemies in place while you delete them with arrows. Personally, I prefer to have light magic on an Archmage Lord, who can ride a dragon alongside your fire mage and provide light magic that way. While there are also other very strong laws of magic such as heavens, I would like to debunk some internet wisdom which promotes the use of life mages as heroes. Life magic is excellent for keeping your dragons and heroes alive, but why waste a mage slot on healing when you can simply hire a lore master of Hoeth to perform this role for you, freeing up the mage for fire or other offensive schools of magic. A life mage hero is a great asset in online battles and I feel like this knowledge has been transposed onto the campaign map. Legendary lords like Alariel, Eltharion and Teclas all have healing spells and Tyrion begins with a noble to boost his replenishment. So the only real efficient use of life magic in campaign is to hire an arc mage of life for a monster heavy army being able to to boost their physical resistance with thorns and providing regrowth mid battle. But trust me, in campaign, after the battle is over, even just having one Blore Master with Earth Blood will be enough to get your heroes and dragons at even higher health than when they started the battle. Now going into the best trades for mages, we start with one where it really doesn't matter what school you choose because we're talking about Entrepreneur, the infamous trade that boosts tax rate by plus 3% and local income by 15%. Simply by having a hero stand around in your most wealthy province will start to skyrocket your revenue. Personally, I cap myself at only having one hero of this type in each province province because it gets ridiculously cheesy, but if you're not bothered by this, go crazy and watch your wealth skyrocket. The next trait boosts a battlefield oriented mage, i.e. a fire mage is a great choice for the incendiary trait which provides a massive boost to melee stats as well as charging which perfectly suits a fire mage charging into enemy blobs in between breath attacks. The final trait I've listed is the conductor trait which is great for laws of magic outside of fire i.e. the ones where you really want to overcast spells by clicking on the spell twice which typically comes at a risk of miscast but this trait reduces your miscast chance by 15% whilst also giving you plus 10 power reserve, as well as a great offensive spell of Uranon's Thunderbolt, providing a great offensive alternative for life and light mages. Now, once that mage tower gets to tier 4, you will also have access to the Lore Master of Hoeth. While these guys aren't honestly anything special on the campaign map, on the battlefield, they are incredible as a fighter healer. Like nobles, they break the high elf stereotype of being terrible in melee, being able to hold the line, as well as deal some damage back. But more importantly, your first stop when leveling them up should be getting earth blood. Whether cast normally or overcast, once a battle is won, instead of writing down the enemy, herd up your characters and dragons and heal them up to as high as the healing cap will allow. I personally put three points in this spell 
spell before boosting my magic reserves in the army, learning some passives before boosting melee defense and armor to improve their line holding capabilities, rounding off at the student of Hoth skill. From here, max whichever spells complement your playstyle best. Whilst Lawmasters prove to be the weakest choice as scouts, having the least useful campaign abilities, this is actually a blessing in disguise because it allows them to double down on their melee defense and spell casting options. In terms of character traits, the best choices the Law Masters have boost the spell casters of the army they are a part of, namely Conductor, which gives plus 20 wins of magic, reduces their miscast by 15%, which is very useful when overcasting Earthblood. They also gain Arcane Conduit, allowing you to replenish your wins of magic and deliver more offensive spells with the other casters in your army. This works very similar to the Disciple trait, which instead reduces the cooldown by all of your spells by 10%, whilst giving a nice plus 10 to melee defense. The final and also very powerful trait which boosts the entire faction is Fecund, which gives plus 50 growth in a local province and 5 growth to all provinces globally. Needless to say, this is excellent, and if you were to leave a Lawmaster out of an army, it should be because they have this trait and are trying to get a brand new province up to tier 4. If you're not lucky enough to get one of these three traits, the honourable mention I have chosen is Medic, giving plus 10 to local replenishment, which is always welcomed. The final hero is also unlocked at tier 4 from the Woodlands line. The Handmaiden, at first glance, is a ranged hero that can't fill that melee gap that needs filling, but she is very strong, just a bit more subtle. On the campaign map, handmaidens can stimulate growth, so putting a couple of these in a new province can get that new conquest up to tier 4 and allow for even more heroes. At level 16, Favoured of Isha provides plus one global public order, which can absolutely stack up in making your new conquest settle that much quicker. On the battlefield, put her on a horse so she can stay away safely and chip away at enemy characters. Like Nobles, she can bolster replenishment, which after stimulate growth should be your next highest priority, followed by any other stats that will boost her melee in case she ever gets caught. At level 12, a handmaiden has three skill trees offered to her, but she can only choose one. The first is Diplomat of the Everqueen, which I only recommend if your handmaiden is standing around to boost growth. If your handmaiden is ever going to set foot on the battlefield, then unlocking the Entangle skill essentially provides a poor man's net of Amentok twice per battle, which is great for dealing with cavalry heavy armies or monsters that would threaten your lines. If you have a second handmaiden in your army, Consider going down the Hawkish Precision line, which grants plus 15% armor piercing damage when enemies are within 70 meters, giving your Sisters of Avalon even more punch. Handmaidens have awesome trade options, getting the best of almost all worlds. She has access to the Mighty Entrepreneur to bolster income, as well as the aforementioned Fecund trait, shared by Lawmasters to boost your empire's growth, as well as Medic, which will boost your replenishment, or if you're absolutely set on making your handmaiden a close combat warrior, which I don't know why, you can always go for Incendiary, but they also gain access to their own unique trait which is resistant, giving 5% resistance to magic and missiles, as well as plus 5 melee defense to all units in your army. Whether to have handmaidens on the battlefield or just simply wandering the campaign map is entirely up to your personal playstyle. The entangle ability can be quite useful on the battlefield, but my personal preference is to source ones with the entrepreneur trait or fecund ability which stacks with their stimulate growth, allowing you to develop your provinces much quicker. If you follow this advice, you can turn your agents into just being an extra pair of hands on the battlefield, into becoming crucial components that cover the shortcomings of the high elf roster on the battlefield and off the battlefield, they can help rapidly stabilize and grow your new provinces as well as secure new diplomatic opportunities. I hope this guide has been informative and helped you out. If you have enjoyed it, please consider giving this channel a subscribe and the video a like, and stay tuned for the next round of faction-focused guides for the High Elves. My name has been Ryder, and this is Elven Plot Armor. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon.